Good evening. It's a great honor, a privilege, a zechut for me to once again be here. And to come back as quickly as I did is really a pleasure. First and foremost, I'm grateful to the Safra Shul and the entire board. My close friend, Rabbi Galamidi, who I'm honored to have gotten to know him on a much more personal level through Zikuy Rabim, through public activities. And my prayer for him and his family is God should watch over them always, that they should see only joy in their lives. Amen. To my wonderful hosts, Erez and Shelly Avital, unbelievable what warm arms they accepted me and how they take care of me. My schedule is not really conventional and they put up with it. Thank you very much and God should bless you that your house should host many Talmidei Chachamim and only joyous occasions. And last but not least, to the real reason I came to Florida in the first place, my dear friend, Leo Zamora, who brought me here, who's been pushing, I'm sure many of you got phone calls from him, and maybe even text messages and stalks that you better show up to the class tonight, and to the wonderful crowd who showed up, and B'Shem Hashem Na'asevan Atzliach, in the name of God, hopefully we will sort out a very touchy topic. Many people call, email, leave messages, come down for appointments to ask one and only one question. Rabbi, what's going to be? And I want to answer that in one sentence. I'm not a fortune teller, and I don't know the future, and definitely not a Navi. But we are going to try tonight together to look through the Chazal, through the Torah, through the words of our holy rabbis, to see how they looked at what we call a global financial crisis that has hit anywhere and everywhere straight across the world. I think every sector, every age group, everybody in one way or the other somehow was affected by this. Wherever you go, this is the topic of discussion. You read the news in the morning, 50% of the paper is dedicated to this, and people are really concerned. And us as God-fearing Jews believe that nothing happens without a reason. There must be a reason behind it. God must be sending some sort of message here and maybe we'll even find within the Torah the solution on how to work around this problem and possibly even turn it into a profitable venture as opposed to a long list of red on the market losses. First of all, I'd like to begin with a very famous Gemara. It's a Gemara in Yevamot, Tav Samach Gimel Amudal, 63a, towards the bottom, where the Gemara says a quote which is used in many different contexts. But tonight this quote may bring us a whole new meaning. The Gemara teaches us that Amar Rabbi Elazar Bar Avina, Rabbi Elazar Bar Avina says, Ein puranut ba'al ha'olam, there's no tragedy, no disaster, no crisis that comes to the world, Ela only bishvil Israel for the Jewish nation. Shene'emar, because it says in a pasuk, this is a pasuk in Tzfaniya Pere Gimel, Hechatli goyim, I destroyed the Gentiles, Nashamu Pinotam, I desolated their corners, Hechavdi Chutzotam, and I destroyed Chutzotam, which is the key word, which normally means the outside, the outdoors. But if we look in the uh, Mitzudat Zion, we see a fascinating thing. He tra- the Mitzudat Zion is a commentary on the Tanakh that translates the words more or less piece by piece throughout the entire Tanakh. And the Mitzudat Zion says, What does Chutzotam mean? Inyan, it's talking about Shuk Urechov, Wall Street, the stock market. Meaning, the Gemara, the Holy Tanaim and Amoraim, close to 2,000 years ago, in advance predicted to us, there will be a day that God will come and make destruction, instability, in Wall Street. And He's doing this for Israel, for us Jews. Why? So the Pasuk continues there. Amalti, I said, God says, that we should learn the code of ethics from this. Meaning, as a start, as an opening statement, we see clearly that God, the Borei Alam, told us in advance, be aware this is going to happen. And if you'll take out of it the message that you're supposed to get, You'll survive the time, it'll be okay, you have nothing to worry about. And if not, then it can end up with khuban, a destruction. So it's extremely important for us, even though it's a little bit hard at times, to pay close attention to the message 
that God wants throughout this financial crisis. But to pay attention, to have an open ear, and an intellectual honesty to understand God's messages is not always an easy task. We're used to habits, we're used to our routines, we're used to our own lifestyle. And sometimes when we have to raise above the daily routine in order to really hear, it takes a strong, mess- a strong effort. In Mishlei it says, Ozen Shomat, an ear that hears, Tochachot Chaim, the Musar of life, Bekerev Chachamim Talin. That ear, that person who has an ear that listens, will rest amongst the sages, amongst the great and wise people. But God forbid what happens to the opposite, to somebody who doesn't want to listen. Soneto chachat, somebody who doesn't, who hates Musa, who hates hearing the truth to his face, who hates hearing the facts as is. It says a very scary word. Excuse me for having to say this. Yamut. And a simple translation means he should die. But we know that Shlomo Amelch didn't curse anybody. And this wasn't the way of the rabbis to speak, to curse and threaten. This is not a Jewish way. So obviously it doesn't mean literal death. What does this mean? My great uncle, Rav Nisim Alav HaShalom, Skutoy Again Aleinu, said a wonderful pshat. He said that what it means is that a guy who's not willing to learn from somebody else, a woman who's not willing to take advice from somebody who's wiser or maybe knows more, or just has more life experience. Yamut, they're losing life. They, have, they don't have room for growth. Because in life we know there's always somebody who knows something different or something more than you. Ezeu Chacham, who's a wise person? Halomed Mikol Adam, somebody who learns from everybody. Somebody who's not willing to learn from everybody. And he says, nah, I know everything, you have nothing to tell me. So he's living, physically he's alive, he's a chai. But it's spiritually, and even in his personal growth, in his personal development in life, Yamut, he's like a dead man, he never grows, he never gets anywhere in life. For us to develop character, for us to develop a life that's filled with growth, We always have to leave our ears open to hear what's the message of the Holy Torah of the great sages and what God wants from us every single day. Last time when I was here, I had the merit to tell you the story of my trip on the way here. And tonight I want to share with you the story of my trip on the way back home. You deserve the story. The following morning after the class here, Very early in the morning, I had to board a plane. I had many more speeches the next day, more than one. And I was in the airport, I get on the plane, and we sit down, we're before takeoff. Near me is sitting a woman. I said hello, she nodded, and that was the end of it. And before the pilot takes off, he gets on the air phone or whatever it's called, and he says, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for boarding whatever flight continental. I would like you to all be aware, we expect an extremely bumpy ride. The planes in front of us reported on big air sacs along the way. That's when the plane suddenly drops midair a little bit. Therefore, there will not be food and beverage services. Please stay seated the entire time with your seat belt fastened. We will do everything in our ability to keep you safe. Flight attendants, please stay seated at all times. Those of you who travel a lot know that's very rare. You don't get that every day. And... I, wasn't, I was listening with a half a year to what the pilot was saying. In my other ear, I had a, one earphone in, and I was in the middle of listening to a speech of my uncle, Allah wa shalom, on my iPod. And exactly while the pilot was talking, my uncle was repeating a story that was very funny, and I was laughing. <laughs> and this woman sitting near me was almost crying. <laughs> and she looks at me and she says, Is everything okay? Do you find this funny? And I said, I actually do. <laughs> And she said, what? I said, well, first of all, I'm listening to something. She says, you didn't hear what the pilot said? I said, yeah, I heard it with half a year. You're not scared? I said, no. She says, you're not scared? I said, no. She says, I'm petrified. I said, I feel for you. I'm sorry. She says, can you teach me the trick? Why aren't you scared and I am? I said, let me tell you why. Because I'm Jewish. And she looks at me and says, so what? I'm Jewish too. I said, oh, welcome, nice to meet you. I said, but I'm Jewish and I know one piece of information that you don't. And she says, and what's that? I said that in the sky, all the way up somewhere there, when I was a young child, my mom taught me, there's this God that's everywhere. And He watches over me every step of the way. So I'm in God's hands. 
And I'm just as safe when I'm in the sky as if I'm on the ground. And there's no difference whatsoever. And she says, what does that mean? And I start explaining here as we're taxiing to the runway. That there's a Borei Olam. He runs the world. He has the power to make miracles. He keeps us safe. He helps us out. Sometimes we see Him, sometimes we don't. But in general, we're protected, we're sheltered all the time as long as we try and do what's right. And this woman looks at me and says, So you mean we have nothing to worry about? And I said, Not only do we have nothing to worry about, but if we understand that this Borei Olam, this God, protects us every step of the way, we may even have a smooth ride. And she looks at me and says, ah, no chance. You can believe this or not, but I'll give you the date if you want. When I flew and look it up on the Continental Records. We took off from Miami Airport. We landed in Newark Airport three hours and 16 minutes later. There was an air delay. This was most probably the smoothest flight I ever had in my entire life. There was not even a little bump along the whole way. And I kept on asking the stewardess uh, on, along the way, the flight attendants, I said, what happened to the bumps? I thought we were having some fun on the way. And this woman is sitting near me. Then she asked me, where do you live? I tell her I live in Lakewood, New Jersey. What were you doing in Miami? I said, I spoke. Where did you speak? In Aventura. Where? In Safra Synagogue. She says, where? Safra Bank? <laughs> I said, no, no, the spiritual bank. Safra Synagogue. The prophets there always rise. The stock never goes down. It's the only place that your investment is guaranteed forever. And she tells me, you know, I don't live that far from there. Since then we have been in contact. And we are not out. Step by step, she's getting closer to religion. Because there's the God that gave her the smooth ride home. Tonight we are going to try through these bumps of the financial turmoil. To find the way to get that smooth ride and survive our way through it, just to coast easily right through everything. And that God, that great God in heaven that we believe in, is going to protect us and shelter us step by step through the way. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai asks a question. When the Jews were in the Midbar, in the desert, the man used to come down every single morning, except for Shabbat. Friday came down two times, that's why Friday night we use Lechem Mishneh, two chalot when we do Hamotzi. Rabbi Shimon said, God is Kol Yachol, He could do everything. So why did He have to send it every single day? Let Him send the food once a year, a big stock. The man never spoiled, it melted, but other than that nothing else happened to it. And they would have food for the year. Every day he had to send a separate and individual portion. So we would think that the reason is because God wanted to send them fresh food every day. But Chazal teach us that can't be because the man didn't get stale. It didn't have problems like that. It was spiritual food. It was lechem min hashamayim, food from heaven. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai answers. He says, if, he says a parable. There was a king who had a son. And his son was living off of daddy's wealth. And his father used to send the money to where he was staying. Large sums of money at the beginning of every year. After a few years the father realized it's only once a year that he gets a phone call from his son and that's at the end of the year when he runs out of money he calls and he says, Dad, how are you? Everything okay? I need more money. Please send me another check. So what did he start doing? He stopped sending him money every day. Every year. He started sending him small increments of funds. And suddenly his son started calling every night to see how he's doing. Because he needed another deposit the next morning in the bank account. We just had some years after the market crashed a few years ago from the dot-com bubble. That we went into Shnota Sova. There was unlimited amounts of money. People touched things that became gold. Things that made no sense. Guys that knew nothing about business went out there and became young brokers. 25 year olds, 23 year old kids became millionaires overnight. And what happens? The bank account is full, and now there's money. There's money to do everything. So I don't need God anymore. I could go, I can come, I could travel, I could do, I have it all. And God realized we started forgetting to call Him every day. The synagogue wasn't packed anymore in the morning. The shiut Torah of the rabbi at night wasn't full. Things weren't going right. And he said, wait a second, what happened to my kids? Where'd they go? I miss them. I want to hear from them every night. 
What did he do? He lowered the finance a little bit. And now everybody comes in the morning into synagogue and starts praying. And when it comes to the prayers for Panasah, they say it with such kavanah. Even the Ilan Kippur, we don't say it with such kavanah. God, please, I need the money. We talk to him every single day. It was a tactic that worked. If we don't want to have to depend on that, if we don't want to always be worried what's going to be next, then we have to show God that we'll be in contact with Him either way. And unconditionally we're in touch with Him. Unconditionally we listen to Him. And then at that point there's no need for this tactic. There was a great rabbi in Israel. He passed away a few years ago. His name was Rav Simonik Diskin. Zechat Tzadik V'Kadosh Livacha. He was one of the Rashi Yeshiva in a famous Yeshiva in Bayit Vagan called Torah. This rabbi died young. He was under 70 years old. He died of lung cancer. He was in the hospital at the end of his days. It was three days before he passed away. And he called his son, who was also a big rabbi in Israel, and told his son, do me a favor, go to the liquor store and buy a very, very expensive bottle of scotch and bring it to the hospital. And his son looked at him and said, Dad, you're not allowed to drink water. Forget about scotch. What do you want an expensive bottle for? He says, I don't care what the doctors say. I want to drink. He says, Dad, I know you for so many years. I never once saw you drinking hard liquor. Now, when you're so sick and it's against what the doctors are advising you, now you decided you want to drink? And he was already scared that maybe something happened to his father's mind. And listen to what this great rabbi said. He said, I want to thank God for the wonderful situation he put me in. And he looks at him and he says, wonderful? This is a tragic situation. The doctors give you days to live. Three days later, he ended up passing from the world. He said, let me explain you. Up until I got sick, before I got sick, I used to think my life is mine. And I'm in control. And I've got to do mitzvot, i got to learn Torah, but that's it. A year ago when I got sick, the doctors gave me two weeks to live. When those two weeks were up, every single mo- night when I went to bed, I didn't know if I'd wake up in the next morning. Because according to the laws of medicine, I shouldn't wake up. So I constantly felt 24 hours a day that I'm 1 million percent dependent on God. And there's nothing in the world that'll keep me here another hour except for God. I never in my life felt so close to the Borei Olam. I never felt that bond that I feel now with God. And that's a reason to celebrate. Go buy me a bottle of scotch. I want to make a l'chaim, I want to drink to celebrate the fact that I developed a new relationship with God. Look at an amazing person, how he was able to take the greatest tragedy and turn it into a growing lesson, instead of letting it pull him down. His son brought back a bottle, and he took a sip. He wasn't able to drink much, but a little bit on his tongue. And with wires from head to toe and tubes in all different parts of his body, he got up and together with his son, he started singing. And his wife was watching on the side crying, how her great husband in all his pain and in all his suffering, feels God every single minute. What an amazing way to live. What a great way to live. We pray that we should be able to live that way without the tragedies. That the tragedies should stay by the Jew haters. And to us, we should only have healthy lives. But we do want to live with that feeling, that close closeness, that bond, that love with Hashem every single minute of the day. And that's part of what God wants from us throughout this financial crisis. The Gemara says, in Masechet Sanhedrin, Dach Tzadik Zayin Amud Aleph, towards the bottom. The Gemara quotes a Pasuk. The Pasuk is in Parashat Hazinu. Ki ire ki ozlat yad, ve'efes atzur ve'azuv. When people will see, ki ozlat yad, there's nothing left in the hands anymore, there's nothing there. The Ephes, and things became zero. Atzuv Azuv, it's all left alone. It's like locked up. You go around the streets here, and you see how many storefronts are vacant. How many buildings are empty. How many houses are up for sale and for rent, and there's no buyers. Why does this happen? So the Gemara writes, we learn from this Pasuk, En Ben David Ba, Mashiach is not going to come. Ad Shetichleb Rutam Akis, until the money, the cash flow, of the pocket is going to be empty. Now obviously this is a gzera ra'ah, so it doesn't have to happen. If we do the right thing, it won't happen. But this is a gemara's prediction. I saw it tonight, over here in the library upstairs, right before I came down. 
that the Baal Aturim writes an unbelievable thing. Ki yireh ozlat yad. The beginning of this pasuk that the Gemara learns out that people will be poverty stricken in the times of Mashiach. Is gematria, the numeric value of it is Ein Bahem Torah. They don't have Torah in them. Ki rek Yozlat Yad. When is that day going to come? That it's going to be Yozlat Yad. The hands are going to be empty. Ein Bahem Torah. The day that they're not going to have Torah in them. The day that they're not going to know how to support Torah. How to respect the Chachamim. How to admire those that are, live a life with Torah. At that point, Ki Efes Atzuv Azuv, God forbid. So if that's the warning... So what's the way to work around it? To grab onto the life, the tree of life of Torah. And hold on to it tight. It's It's a tree of life for those who hold. And Chayim is not only a spiritual life, by the way. For example, the Gemara says, Ani chashuv kimet. Somebody who's poor is considered as if he's dead. So what does that mean? It's Chayim, the life, is the opposite of the Ani. It brings wealth. Torah brings wealth. So another one of the things we have to do in order to protect the insurance policy, to protect our assets, to protect everything we have, is to make sure that we maintain that, that message of Torah, that we there will be people, God willing, that yes bahem Torah, that we have Torah in us. Not having money is a terrible nisayon. It's a terrible challenge. And it's a challenge that's man-created sometimes. And possibly this time it's also man-created. Recently I was reading a write-up of one of the greatest financial analysts in the world, a British professor in finance in Oxford University. He writes, that that parts of Europe are crying over what's going on, he understands. But that that the American people are crying over what's happening, he doesn't understand. They asked for it. They dug their own grave. He says, just a few years ago, they had the dot-com bubble. They struggled terribly after the blow-up of that bubble. The market crashed. There was people losing money right and left. All because of one thing. Their lives were inflated. They didn't realize that it was hollow. There was nothing real to all these big numbers. He says, in less than seven years later, they went and did the same thing again, but this time not in dot-coms, instead in properties. They gave money to people who didn't deserve it. They inflated the price of property to things that people can't afford. Everybody was living beyond their means because the bank was giving out money as if it was nothing. But it wasn't only the bank's choice. It was the federal government that was backing the banks to give out all this money without nothing. He says, why didn't they learn from their mistakes? Don't they realize that when you make a bubble, it's just a matter of time and that bubble pops? As I was reading this article, I said... Unbelievable. It's like reading the Havdila Sefer Musa. What's, what, what's, what's God teaching us here? When life is not real, when what you have is not real, it's inflated. There's a time that's going to come, it's all going to pop, and there's going to be nothing left. Be careful that your assets, not only physical, but spiritual, are real. That you have something real that you're holding on to. That's your only real protection in this world. And sooner or later, as the Pasuk says, nishma, at the end of it all, the truth comes out, whether you like it or not. I want to tell you an amazing story that will help us understand this point a little deeper. There was a young boy in Israel, 26 years old, post-military college graduate, grew up in Ramat Aviv Gimel, that's... Uh, high upper class secular neighborhood in Tel Aviv who one day is driving his motorcycle on the street and he parks outside a kiosk, a little shop and he wants to buy himself a drink and as he's walking in there's a young man standing outside handing out flyers to a Torah class and this boy who never learned Torah in his life takes the flyer and looks at it and he sees that the topic is going to be Mashmauta Chaim, the meaning of life and he says, you know what? I heard from so many different people what the meaning of life is. My dad told me it's money. My mom told me it's being nice to her. My friends teach me it's having fun. Let me see what a Haredi rabbi, an Orthodox rabbi has to say. Maybe he has something interesting to sell too. Let's give him a shot. Why not? 
And he puts the fly in his pocket, gets his drink, drives away, and that evening shows up to the Torah class. He sits in a class and he's fascinated by what he sees. He learns a whole new understanding to life that he never had, and ends up developing a personal relationship together with this rabbi, which little by little leads him up to becoming religious. His father is an extremely wealthy contractor in Israel, most probably the most wealthy contractor in Israel, and, but a secular Jew. And the more he sees his son becoming religious, the less happy he becomes. Sad, but sometimes their parents like that too. And every time his son says he's going to synagogue, his father yells at him, why are you wasting your time? And every time his son says he's going to learn Torah, he says, what do you need it for? And he was giving him a hard time every step of the way, until one night. One night his son looks at him and tells him, Dad, you taught me my whole life that the best gift that was ever given to us is democracy, free will, everybody can do what they want as long as they don't harm anybody else. Me being religious doesn't harm you in any way and doesn't harm anybody else in any way. It may even benefit everybody. Why are you giving me a hard time? Either you're not honest, intellectually, or you change your ways, but one or the other. The father heard that, it came to him as a big shock. And he said, you know what, my son, you're right. He was an honest man, he said, I'm sorry. And from today on, I will support you in whatever you want to do. A few months after this incident, this boy is sitting by another Torah class. And at the end of the class, he's standing outside. And he meets this girl, who starts asking him questions about the rabbi, about the class. It's her first time ever coming to a Torah class. And he starts explaining to her how he met the rabbi, and he tells her a little bit about his life. And she asks him all these questions. And finally, he has to go, and he tells her, you know what, just take my email address, and if you want, send me emails. But now I'm busy, I gotta go. And they start communicating through email, and later on through phone conversations. And at a certain point, he decides that he's going to ask this girl out. And they start dating, and a couple of months later, he's at the point that he wants to propose and get engaged. Okay? But in order to get engaged, he wants to get his parents' approval. He doesn't want to go against what his parents want. So he goes to his father, and he tells his father, Dad, listen, I want to talk to you. His father says, fine, gladly, what do you want to talk about? And he starts telling him, I met this girl, she's really sweet, she's nice, she's amazing, she's great, she's this, she's that. He shows some pictures, he tells her all about her. Then he starts telling him, that's the girl that you saw me with in the house that day, and that's the girl this, that's the girl that. She's also like me, a bala tshuva, she's becoming more religious. We have a very tight bond. I'm thinking of getting engaged. But Dad, I respect you. I would never do it without your approval. I want your blessings to get engaged to this girl. The father looks at his son and he says, what does her father do for a living? What does that have to do with anything? I don't know, but that's the question people ask sometimes. And he says, Dad, I prefer not to answer that. I plead the fifth. He says, what do you mean? He says, don't worry about it. Who cares what her father does for a living? He says, no, 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 I want to know what a father does for a living. So she says, you want to know the truth? He's unemployed. So how many years is he unemployed? He said, two years. He lost his job, he's unemployed. How does he have money? How does he live? He says, a little bit he gets unemployment, and a little bit his daughter helps him out, and a little bit lately I've been helping him out, and that's how he lives. So his father says, what do you need a girl like that for? We're the richest family over here in Tel Aviv. We can get the best families, wealthy family. You're going to go marry into a poor family? It's embarrassing for me. You can't do it. And day after day, he's begging his father, I love the girl. Why would you stop me from marrying somebody I love just for a few dollars? Finally, the father says, you know what? I want to meet this other guy, the girl's father. Let's see, maybe we'll work something out. And he sits down to a meeting with the guy and he tells him this. I don't want you, and I don't want your daughter either, to be honest with you. But my son does, and I respect my son's desires. But at the same time, I hate feeling taken advantage of. And I know I'm going to come and make this big fancy wedding, and it's going to cost me a bloody fortune of money, and you don't have a dollar to your name, you're not going to pay any, not even 1% of the bill. And I, I'm not, I don't agree to that. I'm going to feel on the night of my own kid's wedding taken advantage of. If you want your daughter to get married to my son, there's a condition. That 10% of the wedding bill you pay. And I estimate that's going to be about $25,000. Okay? 
the poor guy says to himself, well, he didn't see $25,000 in the past two years. But on the other hand, his daughter wants to get married. What does a good father do? He says, okay. And for the next few months, till the wedding date, he's busy asking every friend of his to help, to give him a few dollars, to lend him a few dollars, whatever it takes to put together money. He needs $25,000 for the night of the wedding. And if there's a will, there's a way, he comes up with the money. And the night of the wedding, right before the wedding, he counts $25,000 in cash, he sticks it into his suit pocket, and he goes to his daughter's wedding. Beautiful chuppah, beautiful ceremony, beautiful dinner, and then they start dancing. And they dance, and they dance, and they dance, and they dance. And at a certain point, this gentleman, the father of the bride, gets hot, and he takes off his jacket, and he puts the jacket on the back of a chair, and he continues dancing. And about five minutes later, he comes to put his jacket back on, and he puts it back on, and he sticks his hand to the pocket, and there's no money. What's he going to do at the end of the night? And he starts going around from person to person. Did you see at an envelope? Did you see an envelope? Did you see an envelope? And everybody looks at him like, what? What do you want at all? And sure enough, at the end of the wedding, his new mechutan, is the father of the groom, comes over to him and says, payday boy, where's the money? And he starts telling him, you got to believe me, I killed myself for four months now to put together the money and this and that. It was in my jacket, but somebody stole it. The money's not here. And this guy turns red and starts shrieking at him. You crook, you thief what you are. I knew all along you were a guy like that. That's why I didn't want your daughter to marry my son. What does that mean? It got stolen. You never came up with the money in the first place. And a big fight breaks out on the night of this young couple's wedding. The poor girl feels like two cents. Her husband's a nice guy and he tries to encourage her, don't worry about it, whatever it happens, this, that, my father will get over it. But he's a hot-blooded guy and he didn't get over nothing. And it becomes not just, you know, the way fights work. It's like a fire that spreads. So it's not just the father and the father fighting. Now the wives have to fight. And if the wives fight, then the kids get involved. And if the kids get involved, then the friends get involved. And it's already this whole big agenda, the rich against the poor. And they're going to war. This one's talking about him, and he's talking about him, and everybody's talking about the other. Sinat Chinam, unlimited. A year this fight goes on. One whole year. At the end of the year, towards the first anniversary, the Kala, this young bride, looks at her husband and says, we got to do something to make peace. And she starts discussing with her husband all the options of what they can do to make peace. She said, maybe we should give from our own money, the money to your father, and tell him it's from my father, like this maybe will calm down. Or maybe we should mix in a rabbi, or maybe we should mix in a friend, or that can make peace to be a mediator or something. We got to do something to make peace. And this boy listens to everything and he says, listen, nothing's going to work. My father's a very stubborn man. Finally, the girl comes up with an idea that her husband agrees to. He says, we're going to make a night in our house. We're going to invite both sides of the family, but to each side we're going to tell that the other side is not coming. Like this, they'll show up. I'll cook, we'll make a beautiful dinner. We'll rent a big projector and a screen, and we'll watch the video of our wedding. Maybe that'll warm the hearts of everybody, and by warming the hearts of the people, they'll make peace, and we'll walk away peacefully. And that's what they do. They have a beautiful dinner, and the fathers are looking at each other the whole night, and they play the video of the wedding, and they see a beautiful chuppah, and a beautiful dinner, appetizers, and this, and that, everything. And then the dancing. And they see the guy getting hot, and they see him taking off his jacket and putting it on the bottom of a chair, and everybody's looking, but the eyes are not on the dancing anymore, the eyes are on the jacket. And in the middle they see this, that the father of the chatan, of the groom, is dancing together with one of his friends, and as he's spinning around in circles with his friends, he bends over and gives a grab to the jacket and pulls out an envelope and sticks it into his pocket. And this is what everybody in the room sees. How do you think he felt that night? Murai Rabotai, this story is a true story. You know who the characters in the story are? Each and every one of us in this room. God put us down in this world. This is a wedding hall. 
Hai alma ki behilula damia, the Gemara says. This world is one big wedding. Who's the kala? Us. Who's the khatan? God. God makes us a condition. I'll pay for everything. I'll give you a free heart, a free brain, free blood, free blood cells. I'll give you everything for free. I want you to pay. It's not even 10%. It's not even a particle of a percent. Your payment is to keep a few mitzvot. To come to synagogue, to learn some Torah, to give some charity, to be nice to people. That's your percentage. And we agree to the condition before we're born. The Gemara says in Nida, before we came down to the world, we swore that we were going to keep the Torah 100%. And then God put us down into the world. But as the years go by, here we steal an Avera, and there we steal an Avera, and there we steal an Avera, and there we steal an Avera. But then comes the day that God wants to make peace with us. So He invites the families. You want to know who the families are? Our forefathers, Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aharon, David, and Shlomo, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. And He invites His side of the family. Malachim, Srafim, Chayot, Bofane, Kodesh. And He brings them all into a room. And He plays a video. The video at a wedding hall. The video of our life. And everybody watches that video. And that's what the Pasuk says. Sof Tavar. At the end of it all. Hakol Nishma. All those grabbings of envelopes. Suddenly is seen on the screen. How are we going to feel? This is what Hashem wants from us in this crisis. He wants to show us nothing makes sense. When people think the dollar will go down, it goes up. When they think the market's going down, it goes up. When they think it's going up, it's going down. The government puts out news that they're giving $700 billion donation or whatever it is. That day the market crashes. A few days later, it's in doubt if they will or they won't, the market goes up. Everything the opposite of what makes sense. Even the biggest analysts don't go to get interviewed on TV anymore because they sound like fools. They don't know what they're doing. And it's not their fault. They're bright people. And we have respect for them. Chokhmah Bagoyim Ta'amin. They studied in school for it. They know what they're doing. But they don't know anymore. Nothing makes sense. Why? This is all part of that wedding hall. In the video, you know, sometimes by a wedding you bring a comedian or a dancer who makes flips or whatever. This is the dancer that's making the flips. The market flips this way and that way and the real estate flips this way and that way. And God juggles our finances around like a clown in a circus. And we're playing a key role. We're playing the role of the kala. And we have to make sure that the percentage of the business that we have to put in is a percentage that we pay our dues every single month. And by doing that, it works. I have a close friend who called me a couple of days ago. And he said, Rabbi, I need a very big favor. I said, what's the favor? He says, lend me a few dollars. I said, what happened? He says, you won't believe what happened. I said, what happened? He says, I bought a new car. And I... A month ago, a month and a half ago, everything beautiful. I was driving on a highway, I was in an accident, and now I gotta fix the accident, I don't have money to fix it. I said, What do you mean? You don't have car insurance? He said, I thought I had car insurance. I said, What does that mean? You can't get registration in New York without car insurance. How'd you get it registered? He says, No, I had car insurance, and my secretary this past the this past month forgot to make the payment. And when you don't make a payment on your car insurance, they cancel the policy. They send you one notification, two notifications, but after that they cancel it. And a day, one day before the accident, my policy was canceled. I didn't know. I told them, no problem, come to me, I'll try and help you out, but I want to teach you something. I said, God put us in this world. And He gave us insurance. Look, I'm giving you an insurance policy. That you'll have life, and not just life, a good life. But make sure to pay a premium on time every month. So I don't have to cancel the insurance. And for every detail of life, there's a different insurance policy. In the Sefer HaChinuch it says, Why did God give us so many mitzvot that each mitzvah involves a different part of the body? Because each mitzvah is an insurance policy on a different part of the body. Tefillin for a man is the insurance on our arms. Tzedakah is the insurance on our finance. Torah is the insurance on our brain. 
each part of the body, going, walking to synagogue on Shabbat, not God forbid driving, is the insurance on our legs. Every part of our body has an insurance policy. We just got to pay the premium. For the arm, we pay a premium every morning. For our legs, we pay a premium every Shabbat. For each thing, we pay a premium at different time. And we have to make sure that we really pay the premiums and make sure to pay them on time. My uncle, Allah Shalom, said a beautiful, beautiful mashal. He said, imagine a guy is a friend of the owner of Saks Fifth Avenue. And one day he meets him on the street, and the owner of Saks comes to him and says, Oh, what's up, Jackie? I haven't seen you in so long. How you doing? Everything's all right. And he looks at him and he sizes him up right away the way he's dressed, because he's in the clothing business. And he says, Jackie, what's with you? What type of clothes are you wearing? So he looks at his friend and he shyly says, this is what I can afford. He says, come on, that's not a big deal. He said, what do you mean? He says, go into my store, I'll give you a card, take whatever you want, go to the cashier, give them the card, on the house, you don't have to pay anything. Everything for free. Go, buy yourself a wardrobe. So Jackie tells him, oh, thank you for the offer, but I have a problem. He says, what? He said, if I'm going to go to the store and buy a whole new wardrobe, and I'm going to come home with a new wardrobe, and my wife is going to see, and she didn't get a new wardrobe, I'm going to be dead. I'll just need tachrichim. I won't need anything else. So he says, you know what? I'll give you two cards. One for you, and one for your wife. Thank you, thank you, thank you. He takes the two cards. He gives his wife one card. She has a smile from ear to ear. On a wedding night, she didn't smile that much. And he takes the other card and keeps it by him. And he tells his wife, you go whenever you want, I'll go whenever I want, and that's it. You know? Mabruk, we got new stuff. On the house. And his wife goes in, and she goes to this floor, and to that floor, and she gets this done, and that done, and buys this, and that, and everything she's buying, and buying, and buying, and buying, and buying, and buying. And at the end of the whole thing, she comes to the cashier, she, they ring her up, they tell her some insane amount of money, she pulls out a card, they give it to her, they look at it, they see the owner's card, they swipe it, unlimited purchasing free. Thank you, missus, have a good day, and she walks out with all her bags. The next day her husband goes, and he does the same thing. He goes and he gets stuff, and this suit, and that tie, and this brand, and this thing, and all the designers in the world, everything. And he's all done, and he got boxes and boxes of stuff, and he calls up one of his friends, and he says, do me a favor, I have so much stuff here, I can't bring it to the car, come help me. And him and his friends start carrying the stuff out to the car, one box after another, one bag after another. After five minutes, while they're in the middle of carrying out a box of clothes, three cops come and say, hey you, shoplifting, what are you doing? This is theft. And they put handcuffs on him, throw him in the back of the car, and take him to the police station. And he starts screaming at the detective, what do you want from me? I'm best friends with the owner. And he gave me a card. Look, here's the card. I can take whatever I want for free. Why are you arresting me? And the guy said, why did he give you the card? He said, what do you mean? He said, what did he tell you when he gave you the card? He said, he told me, take whatever you want, go to the register, they'll ring you up, give him the card, and you can go. He said, did you go to the register? No. You took the stuff and walked straight out of the store. You didn't go to the register. You're a shoplifter. And a shoplifter deserves a penalty. God gave us a beautiful world. Brand names. Everything. We have a brand name heart and a brand name brain and designed by the one and only, the Creator Himself. And He said, take what you want. He gave us the world to enjoy, not to look at. The Yushami says in Shabbat, Atid Adam liten tadin al kol davar velo neena bekashrut. That one day God's going to judge a person why, on all the pleasures of the world that he didn't have if they were kosher pleasures. He gave it to you to enjoy. But he said, here's the card. Right before you're done, go to the checkout, say a biracha, say thank you, say a prayer, learn Torah, whatever it is. Say you know the owner, and then you can take it for free. But make sure to show the card, because otherwise you're a shoplifter. The world we're in, 
everything is ours. The wealth of the world really belongs to the Jews. It's a, a, a Gemara. The only reason why the Goyim built fancy places is that we should be able to enjoy them. Everything in this world was created for the sake of the Jew. And we are, can have it all. It's all within our reach. It belongs to us. But there's one condition. Go to the checkout and show the card. That card is the class tonight. And that card is that premium that we pay, our insurance for life, not only for our finance, for every single thing in our life. But sometimes, on the way, we fall asleep a little bit. So I want to tell you one of the most amazing stories of my entire life that has to do with somebody who fell asleep on me. This story happened, I don't remember the exact dates, but roughly it began last December. And it continued for a period of time. If I'm not mistaken, it was the last Saturday night in December. I went to Newark Airport at an uh, 1150 flight on Elal going to Israel. And I get on the plane, I board the plane, I sit down in my regular seat, seat 2A. And a couple of minutes later, a guy gets on the plane and sits down right near me, seat 2C. And I look at him and he looks at me and I say, Shalom, and he says, Shalom, and I say, what's your name? And he tells me, Raz. I said, oh, hi, Raz, how are you? And he says, I'm okay. And I'm trying to make conversation with him. And after about one minute, he looks at me and he tells me, Tishma b'chutshik, listen, boy, I'm not in the mood to come pep talk now, conversation, it's not for me. I need Olech Lishon, I'm going to sleep. Before the plane even begins to taxi, he goes into the lavatory, he changes into the pajamas, hangs up his clothes, puts the seat flat, they put him on a sheet, they give him a blanket, takes the pillow, puts two things in his ears, takes two pills that I later on learned were ambiens, and Laila Tov, he's out cold. They wake him up after we already landed in Tel Aviv. Okay? He wakes up, that's a blessing to be able to sleep like that on a flight, isn't it? He wakes up, and again I try to make conversation with him. Where you from, where this, where that. And he tells me again, Tishma b'chutchik, listen boy, in one minute they're coming to get me, straight from the plane, I'm going out through the back door, I'm out of here. I have no time for this. And that's it. Thursday night, I get on a plane, this time from Ben Gurion, to come back to Newark airport, to go home to my wonderful wife and children for Shabbat. I get on the plane, I sit in my regular seat 2A, Two minutes later, a guy comes on the plane, sits in seat 2C, and I look at him, and he looks at me, and I say, Oh, Raz, how are you? And he looks at me, and he says, Lola Mata, you didn't learn? I said, I'm learning disabled, I'm sorry. And once again, the same ordeal goes over again. He goes into the lavatory, he takes off his clothes, he puts on pajamas, he hangs up the clothing, they put the seat flat, the sheet, the blanket. This time there was one difference. Instead of taking the pills with water, he wanted to make sure he's out cold, he took it together with beer. Not such a good idea, not healthy. And he's out cold. This time one thing changed a little bit. Instead of waking up after landing, for some reason they made him wake up before landing. So he woke up about 25 minutes before the flight was over. Again, I tried to start talking to him. He puts on these big Bose noise cancellation headphones on his ears, and there's nobody to talk to. Okay? Before he leaves, he was polite. He turns to me and he says, Hayan Naim, it was a pleasure. Shakes my hand, and he goes off the plane. Three and a half weeks later, I had to be in Israel for a class. This time it was a Monday afternoon, 2.30 in the afternoon from Newark Airport. I bought an Elal flight, but when my travel agent made the reservation, he tells me, sorry, but 2A is occupied already, you can't get the seat. I said, okay, so give me 3A instead. I get on the plane, I sit down in 3A, and the rest of the 12 seats in the class are empty. Okay, people are coming on, they say one minute we're closing the doors, turn your cell phones off, this and that, fine. Then they announced, we're waiting for one more passenger. And one more passenger was Raz. And there's 12 empty seats, and the seat he sits down is in 3C. I said, Raz, what happens to you? I see you again. And he looks at me, and he goes, Dale, what do you want from me? 
I said, I don't want anything. But if you see me so many times, you know, maybe we should say hello to each other. I said, leave me alone. And then he tells me in English, I'm antisocial. I said, I'm a liberalist. You're entitled to be what you like. I figured a day flight, he's not going to go to sleep, right? Let's see what happens. But sure enough, no difference. Goes to the lavatory, takes his clothes off, puts some pajamas. This time he takes three pills. And we can't say Laila Tov, so Tzorayim Tovim, good afternoon, he's sleeping. Wakes up again right before landing, off the plane. But before he gets off the plane, he looks at me. And he tells me, tell me something, when are you going back to New York? <laughs> we landed, it was Tuesday morning. My class was Tuesday night. I had to go back to New York Thursday morning, because I had another class in New York Thursday night. So I tell him, I'm flying back to Thursday morning flight, 10.40 in the morning. He said, oh, thank you, thank you, God. And I said, why? He says, because I'm flying Thursday night. <laughs> I said, Baruch Hashem. Believe it or not, Thursday morning I get onto the plane. I sit down in seat 2A. And in seat 2C, already sitting there is Raz. And I said, Raz, you told me you're flying at night. What are you doing here? And he says, I had a business emergency. I have to be there first thing in the morning. I can't risk the night flight if I miss it, if I this, if I that. I got to get there now. I decided to take the flight. He says, and I was thinking about it, that you're going to be on the plane. So I decided I want to get a ticket on Continental instead. But it was sold out the flight. I couldn't get a ticket. I said, Raz, did I ever do anything wrong to you? He says, no, but I don't know. This is creeping me out already. I can't deal with it anymore. Okay, once again, the lavatory, a pair of pajamas, two sleeping pills, I let over, and there's no of us. February 2nd, I get onto a plane, Saturday night from Newark. I sit down in seat 2A, and once again, by now you could imagine, in seat 2C, the fifth time in a row, who's sitting there? Raz. Raz looks at me and he says, I promise you I'm leaving this plane right now unless you tell me what's going on. <laughs> and I said, Raz, it's very obvious what's going on. And he says, what? I said, me and you have to talk. <laughs> and he says, but we have nothing in common. You're religious, and I hate religious Jews. I told him, I love people that say they hate me. And he says, why? I said, because they always become rabbis at the end. <laughs> he says, where'd you get that crazy idea from? And I see his blood pressure rising. I told him, it's a Gemara. The great sage Rabbi Akiva. Before he came, became Rabbi Akiva. When he was still in Amaretz, a shepherd. What did he say? Me tell me chacham. If they'll bring me a great Torah scholar, what will I do? Then shachenu kachamo. I'll bite him. He hated Talmidei Chachamim. And at the end he became the great Rabbi Akiva. And he looks at me and he says, Oof, you with your stories. And sure enough, I decided to get my last hit before he goes to sleep. And I look at him and I said, Raz, listen, obviously this is meant to be. And if God wants, whether you like it or not, you're going to talk to me. Because he'll wake you up in such a way that you're going to do nothing but talk to me. And he says, yeah, yeah, tell me mashtuyot shalachem, you with your stupid things, and he goes to sleep. An hour and 15 minutes into the flight, there is such turbulence that I'll be honest with you, I had to hold on to God really strongly that day. And the plane is bouncing up and down and up and down, and Raz with all his ambience can't sleep. And he wakes up, and he sits up, and he looks at me before he does anything else, and he says, okay, the dabergvav, speak already, say what you want. And I said, well, what's the pressure, Raz? And he tells me, I want to go back to sleep, so just say what you want. And this is how the conversation started. I told him, Raz, what do you do for a living? And he says, that's what you want to talk to me about? I said, yeah. He says, I own sports teams all over the world. And he gives me a whole list of names. Honestly, I'm not that familiar. So I said, what type of sports are these? I didn't even know the names, what sports they are. So he tells it's not American sports, European, Israeli, this, that. And he says most of them are soccer teams and two are basketball teams. Some are in the big leagues, some are less, whatever, this is business, sports. So I told him, Waz, I want to discuss something with you. 
So he says, what? I said, I want you to explain me a little bit what soccer is about. Teach me the game. He said, what do you want to know what soccer is about? I said, I'll tell you why. When I was young in the yeshiva, next door to me, we had non-religious people, and they used to always make fun of me that I don't know how to play soccer. And I'm a quick learner. Teach me what soccer is about. Maybe I'll learn how to play like this. Nobody could ever say again, I don't know how to play soccer. And he tells me it's very simple. There's a goal, there's a ball, and he starts explaining to me what the ball is, look, look, how the regulations. And you've got to get the ball into the goal. I said, well, so what's the big deal? Let's go now to the field. We'll take a ball, we'll kick it in the goal. And he looks at me like this in disbelief, and he says, is everything okay? I said, yeah, what's the problem? He says, when there's nobody standing there blocking you, it's no big deal to get into the goal. You gotta have 11 players with a goalie trying to stop you and then to outsmart all of them and get the ball in the goal. Then you're playing a game. I said, Raz, your ears should hear what your mouth is talking. When you think everything's beautiful in life and when you think everybody else is wrong except for you, to listen to the truth is a challenge. You have so many things blocking you. You have soccer teams, you have this, you have that, you have your hate to religious people, you have all these issues, you have all these goalies blocking you from scoring. Then is the real chokhmah of when you got to make an extra effort to find out what's true in life. Then is when you really have to work hard. When everything's easy, it's no big deal to do what's right. That's what I want from you. And Vaz looks at me and says, but I don't believe in all this stuff. And I said, we'll teach you. And that's how me and Raz developed a relationship. We're less than a year later. Raz changed lines of work a little bit. He had a technical issue that soccer teams play on Shabbat. And he's now a Shomel Shabbat. He can't own soccer teams. And he sold all his sports teams. Every last one. And went into a completely different business. And every single time I speak to him, which is normally once in three days, he always tells me the same thing. Rabbi, I think I scored a really good goal today. That's what God wants from us tonight. There are so many obstacles along the way. There are so many tests and temptations that we have to fight every single day. So many problems that we have. And he says, now is the real challenge. You got to work around. Go between all these players that are trying to block you. Go between the Satan, between all these negativity, between all these problems. And score the goal. And what's that goal? Living an honest life. Living a life that will lead us up to the Dolsha ben David Bada generation that will be our generation, God willing, that Mashiach is going to come. But in life, we have to do things in a smart, strategized way. Just like if somebody opens up a business and he doesn't have a good accountant and good financial planners and a bookkeeping system, he's going to go bankrupt right away. It's not, never going to last. In our personal life, in our, it's also a business. La sok vidivei Torah, we say in the prayer. The business of learning Torah and keeping the Torah. You need an accountant. You have to calculate the benefits against the losses. Where am I right? Where am I wrong? What can I do better? How can I grow? This is all part of, of growing up in life of becoming a great person. That's our tafkid, our job in life. When it comes to business, it's one of the greatest challenges we have. Being honest in business. Not to cheat, not to steal, not to take advantage, not to lend people money with interest, Jews. Sometimes they're very big tests. Not that God forbid have a business that's open on Shabbat. These are all big tests. These are these players that are fighting against us from scoring a goal. But if we want the Biracha, the blessing of God, that our business should succeed, this is all part of what we have to do. Today we have a whole new challenge. A few years ago when times were easy, it was extremely easy to give charity. We made so much money, so to give a few dollars, big deal. Now when times are tough, this is where God is testing us. Was our charity real or not? Did we cut everybody back? Or do we say, even though it's hard, I'm still going to give. Because what's it the yeshivas for? What's it the synagogues for that I'm making less? They still deserve to continue. And life has to go on. This financial crisis that hit all of us, you know what hit first? 
the rabbis, the people that are running the organizations, the people that have the yeshivot, because we're the first item that gets cut off the list, embarrassingly enough. When people don't realize, it should be the opposite. We're the only real insurance to the money that they're making. We're the only real guarantee to what's happening. I've seen in the past few weeks miracles like that are unbelievable. Stories that I'm embarrassed to even say a lot of them because it'll be hard for you to believe. But I'll just tell you one. A gentleman calls me up one morning. It's 9.45 in the morning. I'm on the car on the way from my house to my office in Brooklyn. And he says, Rabbi, again, I'm calling for a blessing. I said, what happened? What, what do you need? He said, I was just laid off 45 minutes ago. I'm an executive broker in a very famous firm in Manhattan. I'm earning a salary of over $350,000 a year for more than 10 years already. And now I'm on the street. I don't know what to do next. Rabbi, please bless me, promise me that everything's going to be okay. I thought, listen, I'm not a miracle maker, but I can only tell you what the Gemara says. And I started giving him some advice. And I told him, listen, do you give charity? And he says, yes. I said, to who and where, why? Because some people give charity to the Israeli government. That's not charity. That's wasting money. That's not a yeshiva. That's not a synagogue. Plant the tree in Israel. That's not charity. That's a joke. To support Israel for the essence of Kedushat Eretz Yisrael, that's a big mitzvah. But to randomly give money to these places that are non-religious secular institutions and who knows what they do with the money, there's no mitzvah in that. So I started asking him, where do you give your money to? What do you do? He's telling me. Well, he says, but now I'm cutting everybody off. Nobody's getting any more, because if I'm not making new money, I can't give. I said, I understand you. I said, I want to make you a deal. And he says, what? I said, I'm giving you a name of an organization, which happens to be my own, and an address. And if God helps, and you have a job within a few hours, I want you to begin sending Maaseh to the organization every month automatically, and I promise you I'm never calling you to follow up, and I'm not a fundraiser, and I'll never ask you again, and I probably won't even know if you stick to it or not. But that's your deal with God. And one more thing. Do you study Torah every day? And he says, no, on Shabbat I go to the Shiur. I said, promise me that at least 15 minutes a day you're going to study Torah, no matter how busy you are. And the guy says, Rabbi, you have a deal. And he hangs up the phone. 2.30 in the afternoon, my wife calls me, emergency, emergency, emergency. I said, what's going on? I pick a caller back, what happened? She says, there's a guy waiting outside the house, and he says he's freaked out by you, and he needs to meet you emergency. I said, why is he by the house? Send him to the office. So she sends him to the office. My office is over an hour from the house. An hour and ten minutes later, a guy shows up. And he says, I'm Michael Stern, the guy who you spoke to this morning. I said, and what happened? He says, I hung up the phone with you. I went back to the office to start emptying out my files. The CEO of the company came over to me and said, we changed our mind. You can keep your job. I'm telling you a name of a person. Maybe he's a broker for some of you guys. Very, very famous broker in the city. When you do what God wants, when you make a deal with Him and you commit, I'm in! Even when it's hard, or especially when it's hard, nothing's going to stop me. God promises you in return, I'm in too, and everything's going to be okay. There's one more point I want to make, it's getting late, I don't know, Chacham, what's, the, what's my time cap? Wealth is not only measured in dollar figures. And that's something that sometimes is hard to understand. The Gemara teaches us, The entire world gets panasa in the merit of the great sage, Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa. V'chanina beni, and this Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa, Dailo, it's enough for him. Bekav charuvim, erev Shabbat, erev Shabbat. His whole income is one little bucket of buksa from Friday to Friday. That's what he lives off. A few cents. And the rabbis ask, wait a second, it's not fair. All the trillions of dollars of global wealth is in merit of this rabbi, and the rabbi himself has nothing? The truth is, normally it's sad to say, but it ends up happening like that. What do I mean? If just the people that I blessed with wealth over the years would give charity to my causes, we would have unlimited funds by now. But the rabbi is the one who gets forgotten sometimes. That's why Hashem wants us to change. But the rabbis, the Baalei Musa, say a much deeper answer than that. 
They say it's not that he couldn't have more. If Rabbi Chanina ben Dosa would have went to God and stuck out his hand like this and said, Give me, he would have given him unlimited funds. As much as he wants. But to Rabbi Chanina, having one bucket of bucks was enough. And he was happy with it. And he wasn't interested in more. Now, what do you think is better? To have to eat three sandwiches for lunch and then be full? Or to eat a small little sandwich and be full with that? Those of you who are dieting, for sure agree, that it's better to have to only eat less and still feel satisfied. Meaning, what's a bigger biracha? To have a lot or to have a little and it's enough for everything? Wealth is not only measured in numbers. Wealth is measured in how the money goes around. There are people that make millions of dollars a year and never enjoy one dollar of it because they're busy running around from hospital to hospital, from medical problem to medical problem. Their money ends up going to lawyers and lawsuits and doctors and troubles. So what's all the millions worth? And the people who make less of an income, but whatever they make, they enjoy. Because it's net money, they don't have all these crazy expenses. So even if, God forbid, there's a gzera in heaven, that some of our bank accounts look a little bit less than they were, it doesn't have to be a negative thing. It doesn't have to be a curse. God can turn that little amount into a biracha. That that smaller money will go around and be enough, just like the larger amount will be. We'll have less problems, we'll have less expenses, less losses, less costs along the way. And we'll be able to succeed so much more. God has many ways of showing biracha. That's one of them. And another point. God, really, you're going to stop me when I have to, okay? We have a deal. One more, another point. I just thought of it. It says in the Sefarim that when somebody's speaking and he thinks of a new point, especially a story, you have to say it. That's why I say a lot of stories. <laughs> Chazal teaches us, not everything that a person gets is for his good. Yesh osher hashamur lebaalav leraato. This wealth that is saved for a person that works in his disadvantage, not in his advantage. And I want to give you a live example, a story from Chazal. Shlomo Amalek had a general. A general that fought for him many battles. And he was constantly winning all the battles. And after winning one big landslide victory at war, a real hero of a warrior, Shlomo Amel comes to his general and tells him, I want to pay you back, not just your regular salary. I want to give you a bonus. This bonus that I give you doesn't have to be money. It could be anything you want. Pick one thing you want from me, whatever it is, and I promise I'll give it to you. And this guy thinks to himself, money I have enough, I don't need more from him. Powerful, I'm the most powerful person around, I'm the general. Fame, everybody in the world knows me. Look how many wars I won. I'm not missing anything. What could he give me? And then he thinks of something. Shlomo HaMelech was the smartest man. He knew everything. Chachami Kol Adam. And amongst the many things he knew is he spoke all the languages. And the rabbis teach us not only all the languages of people, he even spoke Sfat HaChayot, the languages of the animals. So he tells Shlomo HaMelech, I want you to teach me the language of the animals. Very famous story in Chazal. And Shlomo tells him, sorry, this I can't do. And he says, what do you mean? You just promised me. Anything. This is part of anything. This I can't do. I don't care. You promised and now stick to it. Shlomo says, I want your advantage. That's why I'm not teaching it to you. I don't care. You promised, teach it to me. And he teaches in the language. That night this guy comes home. And he sits down on the couch and he's talking to his wife. But suddenly, besides the talking to his wife, he has a few other conversations going on. He hears the puppy talking to the cat, telling him, our poor owner, tonight, a fire is going to burn out in his house, and everything's going to burn crisp, there's going to be nothing left, our poor owner. And what does he do? He brings the whole fire department on call. And sure enough, in the middle of the night, a fire burns out, and they put out a fire in two minutes. Next step. The next night he comes home, and this time the cat is talking to the puppy. Our poor owner, 
The night robbers are going to come, they're going to steal all his money. And he puts the army around the house, the robbers come, they catch him, and his money's saved. The third night he comes home, and he hears the animals talking between them. Tonight, the two oldest sons of our owner are going to die. And now there's nothing to do. What's he supposed to do? So he goes running to Shlomo HaMelech. And he says, King, save me! And he says, what? My kids! He says, what the cat said, my kids are going to die. He said, that's why I didn't want to teach you the language. God had a gazera on you, that you have to take two losses. So he was going to take your house and your money. You chose to outsmart him and keep your house and money. So now he has to take your kids instead. And that's why I didn't want to teach you the, well, the language. The Navi writes, we read it in the Haftarah recently, that in the times of Mashiach, before Mashiach comes, there's going to be a terrible war. Milchemet Gogu Magog. A war that's going to affect all of us. And at the end, the focus of the war is going to be Israel. To the point that the Amoraim said, Yetevel Lachmineh, we don't want to live in those times. That's how bad the tragedies will be. Maybe, I'm not a Navi, but maybe, God did us a big favor and took away part of our finance temporarily. And with that, He wiped out the decree of the Gzerat Gogu Magog and we won't have to go through tragedy. But rather we'll all go up to Israel shortly, happy and peace, out of joy. We'll dwell in the land of Israel, we'll support the land of Israel, we'll develop the Kiddushat Eretz Israel through happiness, not through an escape, not through tragedy. And maybe that's only because of the financial loss we took that was mevatel de gezera. So before we come to God with complaints, why and why and why, maybe we should realize that He's the master of the world, the creator who knows it all, and who has a plan. And that plan is in our best interest every step of the way. And He only wants anything and everything for our benefit. And instead of saying, Ayeka, God, where are you? We should say, Baruch Hashem, blessed are you, God, for giving me these challenges that I know are in my benefit. And I will do what's right, A, to get back to where I was, if not more. And B, to use this as a kapara, as a forgiveness, to avoid much greater tragedy that could have happened otherwise. That's our real prayer. This is what we're asking Hashem for. I'd like to end off. Oh, a long time I didn't tell you a story. I said Baruch Hashem, I remember the story with Baruch Hashem. In Europe there was a big rabbi who had a driver, but not a driver like we have, you know, on beautiful cars in the parking lot. Then they had different types of drivers. It was a horse with a little wagon in the back and a Baala Agala, a driver. You know, there are many, many stories in the Sepharim about these Ba'alei Agalot. They became very famous over the years. Because they knew all the secrets of the rabbis. They were with the rabbis all the time. And this Ba'al Agala said, Hey, I have a big rabbi in the back. In order to get the horses to, to move forward, normally, what do you do? You take the whip and you hit him. He says, it's not respectful for the rabbi that he should see me hitting a horse like that all the time. It's not respect. I'm going to develop a different system to get this horse to go, to start, you know, to travel. How? I'm going to train him. What am I going to train him? That instead of hitting him, I'm going to talk to him. Like the Chamorosh Bilam. Okay, listen to what he did. He spent a lot of hours, a lot of weeks, a lot of months, I don't know how long it took. And he trained the horse. What, was the, what did he train the horse? That when he says, Baruch Hashem, he should go forward. And when he says, Be'ezrat Hashem, he should stop. And how do you make the horse go faster? You say, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, and it's like, ta, 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 picks up speed. Be'ezrat Hashem, short stop. <laughs> And the horse picked it up. Talmid <laughs> Chacham. He learned quickly. The Gemara has stories about horses, donkeys that, that kept mitzvot and stuff. So this was another one. 
After a few years, the horse started getting a little bit old. And then this guy decided, it's not respectful for the rabbi to drive him around with an old donkey, an old horse. Got to get a new one. Okay, but what do we do with the old one? We sell it. So he goes, and he can't sell it to a Abid, because he's not going to know how to use it. So he sells it to one of the community members. And then he tells him before, when he sells it, there's a very special horse. So he says, I know, the rabbi used it. He says, no, forget about the rabbi, me, I trained him. He said, what you train him? He said, very simple, Baruch Hashem means go, Be'ezrat Hashem means stop. That's the way to use the horse. This guy loves the idea. He says, wait, not only did I get a horse, I got the coolest horse around, I'll be the talk of town. And he goes out to the streets and he starts, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. And he's cool. everybody's looking, look at him, he's prancing around town. And he's Mahmir, he didn't take the wagon. He said, what do I need the wagon for? I'm talking to the horse, I'll sit right on top of him, everything's fine, puts the saddle on and he goes. Then he says, let me see, he learned in the Gemara that the Talmidei Chachamim climbed to great heights. It's a Gemara in Sukkah. So he wants to see if the Talmidei Chachamim's horses also could climb to great heights. So he goes to the desert and starts going up and down the mountains and the hills together with the horse. Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. Suddenly he comes to the top of one of the mountains and from far he sees five feet ahead of him, ten feet ahead of him, that there's a cliff, a vadi, goes straight down to nowhere. And he's thinking, oh my God, what's going to be? And he gives a shriek, Bezrat Hashem! And like at the last second, with one foot up in the air already, finally the horse stops. Oh, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. Let me tell you a story that a friend of mine told me. His name is Rabbi Benjamin Blech. He had a great job. He was a financial consultant in one of the big firms. But he didn't have a lot of time to learn Torah because he was always busy. And when his friends used to come to him and tell him, Come learn more Torah. Come learn more Torah. He said, I'm sorry, I'm busy at work. Sorry, I'm busy at work. And one day, his friend told him, No, just come, forget about work. Come, study at least 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour a day. Study Torah. And he tells his friend, Listen, I don't know, there's just no time. So his friend says, You know what? Why don't you start praying to God that He should give you time to learn Torah? And he started praying, and he prayed really hard. And three days later, he lost his job, and he has plenty of time to learn Torah now. When we pray, we have to be very specific and very careful in the words that we pray for. Of course we pray to have time to learn Torah. But God, give me time to learn Torah and pray, but not on the account of other things. That there should be enough time for everything. Uberachticha, I will bless you, God says, Bechol Hashel Taseh, in everything you do. We don't only want Beracha in one area. One of the things that worries me greatly is that now in this time of financial turmoil, when we come to synagogue, the only thing we remember to pray for is money. What about health? What about our kids? What about our family? What about our friends? What about Mashiach? What about these young kids in Israel that are standing on the battlefields day in, day out, and dealing with these disgusting terrorists who all they want to see is us in the ocean? Are they still in our mind? Well, the only thing that's important is tikhala panasa. We have to be very careful that our prayers, that we need many of them, for wealth, for panasa, doesn't come on the account of forgetting all the other things that we also have to pray for. I want to tell you another cute story. One day, I'm walking on the street, and I see something that I'll tell you the truth bothered me. I see a storefront with a big sign. Here, we hate doing business with Jews. We only want to do business with Arabs. I said, in America, such a hate in a window of a store. What's going on here? It's the most evil thing possible. I decide I'm going to go and I'm going to talk to the store owner. I come to the door, I'm about to open the door, and I see a big sign on the door. This is the Hevra Kadisha, the funeral home. Chazal teach us, Teshubah, Tefilah, Tzedakah, Ma'avirim, Et Roha, If 
we do teshuvah, if we pray, if we give charity, it doesn't say God cancels the gezerot. Ma'avirim, He transfers the gezerot. Why doesn't it say mevatlim et roa gzera? They cancel the gzerot. You want to know why? We don't want the gzerot to be canceled. If there's a big gzerot that everybody should, that people should lose their money, we don't want it to be canceled. We want the gzerot to work full force. Just not on the Jews. It should be transferred to these sheikhs that control the oil. Let them lose their money instead. It should be transferred to these Iranians that are threatening to blow up the world. Let them lose their money. If God forbid somebody's sick, and we pray that the sickness goes away, we don't need the sickness to just vanish into midair. Let it go into this Ahmad al Jina, whatever his name is, that guy, Let it go to him. Why does it have to be cancelled? Why do we have to go to war in order to win battles? Hashem ish milchama. Let God fight our wars for us. Let our enemies die on their own. Why do our young kids have to risk their lives to kill them? That's what we're praying for. That the blessings should be transferred to us on every front. In the merit of the good deeds, the acts of kindness, and the growth that we have every day. And the tragedies should be transferred to the Sonei Israel, to those who cause problems to us, to those who hate us, to those who don't want to see us in the ocean. And Hashem Shomea Tefillah. God listens to our prayers. And as long as we ask, and we're insistent, and we don't do anything to block the way, at the end He comes through. And He gives it to us. Because He's a Father who loves us. And He loves us unconditionally no matter what. And the only thing He wants to see is that each and every one of us should have what He needs. That's what we turn to Hashem tonight and say. That in the school to the many that took a night off, I'm sure there were many other things going on. I know, because we called people today to come to the class. The excuses that I got horrified me. I'm going to play basketball, I'm going to play baseball. I'm going to this, I'm going to that. Every excuse in the book. And all you beautiful Jews made a Kiddush Hashem. You were part of a public Kiddush Hashem. To come to hear Torah. To come to hear the word, the message of God. That's a humongous merit in heaven. I said this last time. Lately I've been repeating this in every single class I give almost around the world. That I found the Midrash. A Yalkut in Mishlei. And I found another source for it also. That Kansim at the time that the community comes together and they hear from a rabbi the right way to live, the words of God. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God in heaven sits on His throne and He looks down and He says, I forgive you for all your sins. Forget about all your bad. I only see your good and everything will be fine for you. Each and every one of you tonight that came to here, that joined us according to the Yalkut, was just blessed by the greatest blessing in the world. That God came down and said, I forgave you. You have a clean slate. Walk out of the room tonight knowing you're starting over again. Just don't dirty it. Don't mess it up. Do it right this time. Try your hardest. And in the merit of the Kiddush Hashem, in the schut, in the merit of the Tzibur, and in the schut of Allah Shalom HaManuach, my great uncle, Rabbi Nisim Ben Rachel, again, God should bless us all. That we should be happy. We should be healthy. We should be wealthy. We should have only good occasions and only happy occasions. And God willing, my personal prayer and blessing besides for everything else is, is that the next time I have the merit to come back and see all you wonderful people, there shouldn't be standing room in the room anymore. Because everybody here just has to bring one more person and we pack the house. We make a glorified Kiddush Hashem. We show Hashem how much we love Him. And we grow and grow and grow. Thank you very much for listening and thank you for having me tonight. Thank you.